First, this bulletin from the WOR newsroom. Six members of one family have been found shot to death in their night clothes in their expensive home in Amityville, Long Island. The only available information at this moment, according to the Amityville Village Police, is that the, mem the victims have been identified as members of the DeFeo family. They were found by a 23-year-old son, Ronald DeFeo, who is believed to be the only surviving member of the family. Six members of the family found shot to death in their home in Amityville, Long Island. We will have further details on the 11 o'clock news. This week on the paranormal side, we're going to be talking about the Amityville horror case. Have you ever wondered what happened on November the 13th, 1974, the night that Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed his whole family? We're going to also be diving deep into the story of the Lutzes, Lutz family that moved into the house a year after the murders, to see if any of their stories hold any water. Was there any truth to it, or was it just a big hoax? We're going to tell you the story and present you with some of the evidence. So by the end of this video, you can make up your own mind of what you believe. Now this is one of the first big cases of the Warrens. So if you like true paranormal stories and real paranormal investigations, please consider subscribing to our channel. So let's get right on into the story. In the fall of 1974, the DeFeo family, which consisted of seven family members, would suffer a terrible crime. All the members of the DeFeo family were killed except one member. The surviving member is the one who committed the crime and killed his whole family that fall night in 1974. The DeFeos were not a picturesque happy family and there were many rumors of the father, Ronald Sr., being very violent. It is rumored that he was not a very good father, and many believe that Ronald Jr., a.k.a. Butch, became a troubled young man. Ronald Jr. was employed at his father's auto body shop that his father, Ronald Sr., ran and kept the books for the business. But Ronald Jr. didn't spend a lot of time at work. He would rather be at his local bar. It is said that Ronald Jr. became addicted to drugs, and this may be why he became violent towards his family. Ronald Jr. drew a gun on his father during a family heated argument, and there were many times he would physically freak out on his family too. So on November 13, 1974, Ronald Jr. ran into his local bar screaming, that his mom and dad had been killed and so the police were called. When the cops did walk through the house they found the six bodies of the family. When identified they were found to be the father Ronald DeFeo Sr. 43 his wife Louise 42 their daughter Dawn 18 and Allison 13 and their two sons, Mark, 12, and the youngest, John. And the guy who called in the crime was Ronald Jr., 23, the only survivor of the family. None of the family members' bodies show any sign of struggle. And very oddly, none of the gunshots woke any of the family members up. And the bodies were found lying face down in their beds. The weirdest thing of them all is that none of the neighbors heard the gunshots and it is reported that there were no silencers found or used during the crime. The only thing that some of the neighbors reported was just hearing the DeFeo's dog barking, but none of them reported hearing any gunshots. After Ronald Jr. killed his whole family, he took a bath and got ready for work and later that day went into his favorite bar and reported the murders. 
to the police around 6 p.m. He came, he opened the door, and he was screaming, come on, help me, somebody shot my mother and father. And everyone ran out of the bar, and that was it. They all took off. No, I had to stay. I was ten anymore. They all jumped in his car and took me. Today, police combed the DeFeo's handsome three-story house for clues while divers explored the backyard swimming pool for the still-unfound murder weapon. Police have been questioning the son, Ronald, and now say he is being, quote, safeguarded. Investigators say without explanation that they now feel young DeFeo was in the house at the time of the murders, but they're not yet considering him a suspect. And so we forth. have no suspect at this time. Is we Ronald have no indication of the motive at this time. What about Ronald uh, DeFeo, the son, the surviving son? Ronald is being safeguarded by the Suffolk County Police at this time. Why safeguarded? Why? Because the six members of the family dead, and we don't know why, and he's the sole remaining member. The also a suspect? He's not a suspect at this time. Few people in the neighborhood knew the family well, but those who did described them as close-knit. Well, I figured, I think they were just very sweet, very religious people, very family-minded people. And that's about all I could say. Very good, very generous, this type. I mean, very close with their children. There's one element in the usual mass murder story which seems to be missing from this case. There's no sense of fear in this community. No feeling of a mass murderer on the loose. People we talked to seem to feel that whatever was the motive for this crime, it had something to do with the family. It's not something that's going to return to bother anyone else. In Amityville, Long Island, Phil Barno, News Center 4. Ronald Jr. claimed that it was the work of a mafia hitman and that there were two other accomplices with the hitman. Ronald Jr. said when the hitman showed up that morning to his house that he put a gun to his head and made him kill his family members one by one. It wasn't long though before his alibi started to fall apart. Ronald eventually broke down under interrogation and admitted to killing his whole family. The supposed hitman had an alibi that he was out of town during the murders. Ronald confessed that once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Now, Ronald's story has altered many times. It is really hard to tell what really happened. And depending on the interviewer and what Ronald believed that the interviewer wanted to hear, the story that night changed every time. Well, the fail seen him. My father. He's the cause of all this. The only way to get rid of him, he's got to go back to hell. I lived in that house all those years. I have never saw anything really peculiar or strange. Never once. Anybody buys that house and got kids and move in there? Come on, man. You got to be, you really got to be. Something wrong with you. One of his claims was that he was possessed by Satan, and that is why he did what he did. He also claimed to be in the basement during the time of the murders, getting high and watching a war movie. And when the war movie was over, a black shadow person came into the room to hand him the gun. So with his ever-changing story of that night, it's hard to believe any of the stories Ronald told. Needless to say, Ronald Jr. was found guilty. He was sentenced to six consecutive sentences of 25 years to life on December 4th, 1975. Amityville Horror goes way back before the Lutz family who moved in there and bought the house later mm -hmm. and were fled 28 days later. It goes back six months before the DeFeos were murdered. Mr. DeFeo mm -hmm. went up to Montreal, Canada. He went to a shrine where many miracles had occurred. A lot of people don't know this. He went to that shrine and he brought back from there a priest, an exorcist, who said masses in the house. Why? If this was a hoax that was created by the Lutz family, why six months before this man was murdered and his family was an exorcist in that house? Hmm. While the priest was saying a mass and performed the exorcism rituals, candles were blowing out, doors were opening and closing. There were footsteps all around the house. Ronald DeFeo, who was the murderer of his family, fled the house. He didn't stay there. He did not want to stay there while the priest was in that house. What caused him to leave? Obsession? Possession? Who can say? About a year after the DeFeo family murders, 
in the same home of the DeFeo's residence on Ocean Boulevard would become the dream home of a new family, the Lux. We first saw the house in the fall of 1975. Went over with the broker. She said, I wanted to show you what the other half of Amityville lived like. Pulling up to it, she started to tell us things that the house had as far as a number of bedrooms. When we walked in the house, Kathy looked around right from the foyer and just started smiling. She really fell in love with the house. It was very obvious. And we walked through, it had six bedrooms and a boathouse for our boat and two car garage and a heated pool and a basement on the water, which was very rare. All the things that we talked about, we found in one place. For George and myself, we could bring more things together within this marriage, a new home, space for everybody, space for growth. Now, if you've ever wondered if a residence can hold residential energies from a traumatic event of its past. The house in Amityville would surely be a classic case of a haunting. Newlyweds, George and Kathy Lutz, finally found their dream home. Kathy had three children before meeting and marrying George. The Lutz family consisted of five family members at the time. The stepfather, George Lutz, the mother, Kathy Lutz, and the kids, Daniel Lutz, Christopher Lutz, and Missy Lutz. After looking at the house, they were informed of the home's history. But despite its murderous past, the Lutz decided that they loved the house and they wanted it to be theirs no matter what. They couldn't pass up on the bargain price of $80,000. And she explained to us about the DeFeo massacre and wanted to know if that would change our view on the house at all. We discussed it among the five of us and there was no problem. It was, you know, it was unfortunate that that had happened there. It was reflected in the price, of course, but we weren't superstitious thinking that there was anything wrong that way. There was a sign outside the front of the house when we first looked at it said high hopes and when I look now those same high hopes were within us moving into a home with a past like that didn't bother the Lutz very much but never in their wildest dreams did they foresee the events that were going to unfold over the next 28 days their dream home was about to become their nightmare as they were first moving into the home Kathy called a local priest. As is common with many Catholic families, Mrs. Lutz asked her parish priest to stop by and bless the house. This blessing began in the sewing room and seemed to set off a chain reaction which would jeopardize the lives of everyone involved. Because of criticism later leveled by other church officials, the priest has never before talked to anyone in the media. In search of was able to locate him and he agreed to tell us his story, but only if he could remain anonymous. I was blessing um, the sewing room. It was cold. It was really cold in there. And I thought, gee, that's, this is peculiar. You know, because it was a lovely day out. And, and uh, it was winter, yes, but I, it didn't account for that kind of coldness. I, I also was sprinkling holy water. And I heard a... a rather deep voice uh, behind me saying, get out. It seemed so directed toward me that I was really quite startled. I felt a slap at one point on the face. I felt somebody slap me and there was nobody there. Strange events also affected the priest who blessed the house. He discovered blisters were festering on his hands. I went to the doctor for it. And he couldn't explain it. He thought it might be caused by anxiety, and of course that's, that's feasible. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm given over to psychosomatic responses. He called the Lutzes to warn George and Kathy. Noise 
Kathy's interference prevented any communication. Kathy? He could never get through. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello. Hello. It wasn't until much later that we learned what it was that had happened to him while he was doing that. He did stop us before leaving and say to us that not to spend too much time in that sewing room. For some reason, he felt uncomfortable there. Times when Father Ray would attempt to call us and the connection again would be broken up with static. When we first looked at the house, very first time, we noticed no flies anywhere in the house. Especially when you think back now, they were limited in particular to the sewing room second floor, the same bird room that Father Ray had asked us not to use as a bedroom. The longer we were in the house, the more flies there were in that room. I don't have an explanation for how or why, but that's where they were. The paranormal events began to unfold as soon as the priest left. George and one of his stepsons, Daniel, witnessed the door to the boathouse open and slam shut repeatedly and with great violence. The family dog was really disturbed by this. His pen was right beside the boathouse in an attempt to escape. He jumped over the fence of his pen suspended above the ground by his lead, seemingly trying to hang himself. But they rescued the dog just in time. Now George was a businessman, but as soon as he moved into the house, his attitude changed by becoming very ill-tempered and cranky towards his new family. Within a week of moving in, Kathy's hand had been touched by something unseen. George soon found himself waking up at 3 a.m. every morning and wasn't able to go back to sleep. That is what is believed to be around the same time that Ronald DeFeo carried out the murders a year prior. On another night, George was outside and looked up at his stepdaughter's Missy's bedroom. George said that he seen what looked like a pig with glowing red eyes staring at him, knowing that his stepdaughter was supposed to be in bed asleep. George ran upstairs as fast as he could. Missy was asleep. He couldn't explain what he had seen. Daniel Lutz, George's stepson, he's now an older grown man, that recounted what he had seen that night in the window with George, and I quote, it would have been what looked like a cartoon character of an angry pig with wolf-like teeth. When he and George went upstairs to investigate, they found a rocking chair moving back and forth by itself. I saw eyes looking down at me from Missy's bedroom window when I would be coming back from the boathouse at night. I would run into the house, run upstairs, and there'd be nothing there. There would be times that Missy would be sitting on her bed talking, and you'd walk past, and you'd see the rocking chair moving, but Missy was on the bed. There were a couple of times that we saw eyes from the outside looking into the house. Not long after this incident, Missy started speaking about her new invisible friend named Jody. Missy went on to tell them that Jody was a pig, sometimes as big as a teddy bear and other times as big as a house. The youngest of the three children was very candid about talking about her friends in Amityville and what she was referring to would be this Jody the pig and like that that would come in and sit on the rocking chair in her room and rock. To her, they were friends. Now keep in mind that when we go into a home, you know, these people are telling us these horrible stories, but we have to ourselves experience this before we accept it. Right. We have to see it, we have to feel it. We have to know it's there before we say, yes, this home is haunted. Mm -hmm. And this home was not haunted by anything human. No. It was inhuman. Many people ask us about that. 
it was inhuman, and then they say, well, uh, people went in there later and lived there, and nothing ever happened to them. Well, who's to say that the house was not exercised? So George and Kathy both decided to try to bless the house themselves and quickly heard voices telling them to please stop. That same night, things really geared up. George witnessed his wife's Kathy's face change with what looked like a 90-year-old woman, and that would take hours to wear off. This apparently happened a few times, with Kathy's mother even being a witness to it. One of the things that happened, no matter what, George couldn't get warm, so he stayed by the fireplace and kept it going. He became obsessed with how much firewood there was and then would there be enough to keep burning that he would be continually going about the fireplace checking the fire this is when they saw a demonic face in the fire looking back at them george reported hearing what sounded like doors being ripped off the hinges and when he would run downstairs nothing would be disturbed even reports of cloven hooves in the snow, a green gelatin-like stuff coming from the walls. Uh, in the beginning, uh, George and Kathy would feel the psychic cold throughout all the rooms. No matter how many logs they'd throw on a fire, it was icy cold. That's because it's a psychic cold, and the cold is being drawn. Uh, the heat from the bodies of the people in that house is being drawn and that heat is going to be used as an energy fuel source for the spirits in that house. So they'd feel the psychic cold, they'd hear magic whispering voices throughout the hallways. Uh, at night uh, they would see ghost lights over their beds in the rooms. There was a time when George and Kathy found themselves about two foot from the ceiling. George looked over at Kathy and said, do you believe this? Do you believe it? And of course then he went to lower themselves down into the bed again. But there would be the footsteps. Uh, there would be the um, slime that they would find on the staircase. Now these are called apports. Mm -hmm. These materialize or dematerialize in such wanted houses. Uh, for instance, uh, in many homes that we go into, we will find that uh, you might see blood as they did coming down the wall. But if you went over there and touched that wall, there'd be no blood. This is a telepathic projection to the viewer, and it bypasses the physical eye, goes into the mind's eye, and they see it as a medium would see it. Uh, there was the marching uh, band, as they described it, around 3.15 in the morning when the murders had taken place. A lot of things would happen at around 3 o'clock. We call this the devil's hour mm -hmm. because it's an insult to the Trinity, anything that comes in threes. Uh, they would hear this marching band. George would jump out of bed. He'd go running down the stairs. As soon as he'd get down to the foyer, the music would stop. But he'd look into the living room, that huge living room, mm -hmm. which you'll see a picture of, and the rugs were actually rolled up and the furniture was pushed over to the sides of the walls as though somebody were actually marching there. Uh, there were so much different types of phenomena that occurred to us and the people that went in there. It was incredible. I told you about the experience last week of where I felt as I was being smothered. Mm -hmm. Uh, going into that home again, uh, Lorraine felt many things. She, as a clairvoyant, would be more sensitive. Mary Pascarella, who was uh, the director of the Psychic Research Institute in Hamden, Connecticut, never went into a haunted house after that. She gave up the work Is because right? she was so badly affected by it. Mm -hmm. The cameraman uh, that went in there with Channel 5 news team uh, had heart palpitations. These guys they were in battles in World War II. Of course, it bothered them, but never as much as going into that house there. Well, it was the physical effects on their body, Tony, mm -hmm. that was bothering them. And then one of the scientists that had come up uh, from Duke University, he became so terrified in this home, and the chair that he was sitting on actually went right backwards with him in it. They had a real hard time just stabilizing him emotionally in that home. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like, and it's true to the fact that people are affected on their weakest, most vulnerable levels. And I think many times people of science go into a home like this 
not really expecting to be affected personally, mm -hmm. just to be there and be witness to it. Mm -hmm. But they have nothing to fall back on. They have no faith, Tony. They can't call on any inner strength other than their own personal knowledge. There was also a discovery of a secret room in the basement that was not in the original house plans. This room was painted blood red and it was only big enough for only a few people to fit into it. The dog even stayed away from this room and wouldn't go near it. I was down in the basement one afternoon and there was a particular shelving area that uh, I really wanted to relocate and look like a portable. So I moved it and much to my surprise, there was a, a small room behind it and it was painted a red. We keep calling it a room, but we don't know what else to call it. It's a very small space. The fact that it was red and that it had an odor was the disturbing part. Then when Harry, the, our black lab, wouldn't go near the room, <laughs> cowered away from it, that was more disturbing. My name is Patty Camarado. I was friends with Allison DeSeo, the girl who was murdered with the rest of her family here in 1974. This, I'm going to show you, is a mysterious red room that's so noted for in the book. This door, which they say was never here, was here, is here, always will be here, I suppose. This is the red room. Nothing more than a storage area where Allison and her brothers and I used to keep toys. Just red, you know, because never any feeling of spirit presence or ghosts or any sort of thing like that. It's just a play area. We used to keep toys. Nothing more than that. There are reports of marching bands that George heard in the living room. When George went down, all the carpets and the furniture were rolled up and moved to the sides, and there would be no one around. On the last night, the Lutz spent in the house in Amityville. The two boys and Kathy were lifted up in their beds by some unseen force. Kathy's son, Daniel, has described how he was terrified as the headboard of his and his brother's bed smashed against each other and the ceiling. They were trapped on the beds as they levitated. They could take no more. After 28 days of living in their dream home, that last night they stayed in the Amityville house was on January 14, 1976. There were many other scary incidences that took place that same night. George Lutz was an ex-Marine. He was a karate expert. <clears throat> he ran around with motorcycle gangs. We're not talking about any altar boy here. We're talking about a rough, tough guy who after 28 days in that house fled, left everything behind, took his wife and children, and went off to California. See, he was the type of person <clears throat> that felt like he was, had to always be in control. He would go out on the landings. It was three stories high. The home is very beautiful. The interior of the home is very formal, and it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And he would go out, and he would take his fist, and he would tell what was there or command what was there to come out so he could fight it. Because as far as he was concerned, he was very skeptical regarding the fact that anything paranormal was going on. At the time that this first began, he found it difficult because of his background to even believe in a god, never mind believe that something of this nature was taking place. They were so afraid that the Lutzes were driven from their dream home, running out in nothing but their clothes, abandoning all of their possessions, never to go back. They were definitely afraid of something. To the house, like who was the gentleman that, or people that called you in? Was it the Lutzes that called you in? No, it was not, Tony. It was Marvin Scott who called us in. He told us there had been a tragedy in that home. He didn't go into detail regarding it. He told us that it was a prominent family. Mm -hmm. he, he also told us during that very first conversation that the family that were living there at the present time had fled and left all of their possessions behind. And their viewers were very interested in the history of that house and what exactly might be wrong with the home. 
that's how we first became involved. Mm -hmm. Now, I had to tell Marvin Scott at that time that there was no way that we could go in that home without an invitation and permission from the family, which came very readily. Mm -hmm. But realize, when we met with uh, George Lutz, not Kathy, because Kathy and the children were not there, when we met with George, he wouldn't go anywhere near the house. He met us at a pizza parlor and really? sat with us and talked because he was so frightened. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even know how bad it was that day, but as she said, George Lutz wouldn't even go to that home. He said, there's no way I'm going into the house. And when I asked him at this restaurant where we met him, I said, Mr. Lutz, what happened to you in that house? He didn't say anything. He just looked at me. He said, you know. Hmm. I said, I don't know, Mr. Lutz. I said, what happened to you in the house? He looked at me again. He said, you know. I said, I really don't know. I was getting a little irritated because I wanted to find out what kind of experiences this man had. But he was actually afraid to talk about what happened for fear mm -hmm. that it would happen again. Mm -hmm. Because at his mother-in-law's house at Deer Park, when Kathy himself and the mother-in-law would start talking about what happened there, things would happen in the house at Deer Park. In Be fact, because George of the and Kathy levitated in that house, too. Yes, they levitated. They, they oh, levitated yes. both. They, they had phenomena follow them from Amityville. Now, Tony, we know this happens. We know that even ourselves involved in research, that you go to a location where haunting phenomena is going on, active phenomena, and you leave and go home, and you give it a lot of recognition, you, or you listen to the tapes and like, while you're still programmed, then it, Something you can't can, come to you. Yes. But this next picture that we're going to see I think this, taken is a, again, this is an astonishing picture, in fact. Yes, with infrared film. Oh, yes. And it's in the upstairs bedrooms. Just to the left there, you see what looks like a small boy's face looking out with bioluminescent eyes. This was the room of one of the young boys who was murdered there. Isn't that eerie? Now, a lot of people would say, well, is that the spirit of the young boy? No, it is not the spirit of the young boy, but it is a diabolical spirit with luminescent eyes that appears in that home <laughs> to confuse the investigators. But it, it, you think that is an evil spirit, Ed? Positively. Everything about this house was evil. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I was in that house one time, and nothing ever happened to me. It's not that a house is haunted 24 hours a day. You don't walk into a haunted house and see ghosts flitting all over the place. Mm -hmm. After 9 o'clock, the psychic hours start, 9 to 6 in the morning. Mm -hmm. 9 o'clock, the energy starts to build up because of the darkness. Mm -hmm. Then you start to get what we call the infestation in a house like Amityville. First, you hear the little knockings, the rappings. Then you might hear pounding sounds. Then you might hear crying or sobbing, uh, hysterical laughter. These are the types of things that actually happen in these homes. Mm -hmm. But pictures like this taken with infrared film, the camera is neither for nor against the supernatural or right. supernatural world. Right. It only takes what it sees. Mm -hmm. And what it sees here is a spirit of a diabolical nature in that room. There may be things that may have happened in that home over those 28 days that we will never know about. Kathy's son, Daniel, now an adult, tells another tale, one that he was denied a chance to tell when he was younger. He states that all the hauntings happened and were triggered by George Lutz. Daniel says that George was a man who liked dabbling in the occult, and he believes that George was directly involved with triggering what was going on in the house, and it was kind of like a magic trick that had gone bad, that he couldn't shut off. Daniel has collaborated his mother and his stepfather's story of the paranormal happenings in Amityville. Christopher, Kathy's other son, he's also said that the hauntings were no hoax. But he says his stepfather George brought the troubles on himself by dabbling in the occult also. When we moved into the house, we were practicing transcendental meditation. I think in the practice of that, it opened up the mind and the spirit to other things and brought about a sharpened sensitivity. And I think we opened ourselves up to it. I think that whatever was there 
was very intelligent, very impatient. I think its abilities are far more powerful than we really understand. I think you know evil from experiencing it. I would say it was demonic. It took a dream and it shattered it. It took innocence and it destroyed it. And it was out for life itself. It is believed that the Montauk Indians once thought the land on which the Amityville house sits was infested by demons. Tribal enemies and those said to be possessed by evil spirits were left to die on the land and then buried face down. Cursed to stare for all of eternity into the darkness. Another legend about the Amityville house land dates all the way back to the Salem witch trials of the late 1600s. A man named John Ketchum is said he was forced out of Massachusetts for practicing witchcraft. He set up residence on or near the spot of the Amityville house. It's said that he continued his devil worship up until the day that he was buried somewhere on the property. But him fleeing Salem over practicing witchcraft on the land has never been verified. This is where the Shinnecock Indians had an enclosure. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where it all started with the Shinnecock Indians. They had an enclosure right there where they put the sick, the mad, and the dying. Uh -huh. Demonic spirits, evil spirits, mm -hmm. are drawn to the sufferings of human beings. And this already had an aura of disaster about it. John Ketchum was the man who built a small cottage right there where the Amityville home is at the present time. And after his, or prior to his death, mm -hmm. he had said that he wanted to be buried on that land. Now, he was ousted from Salem for his mm -hmm. witchcraft practices. Okay. So he didn't have exactly a good track record. Now, people that purchased the property after his death claimed that haunting phenomena occurred there. Mm -hmm. Now, it was moved, Tony. It was moved to a location a couple of blocks away, and the thing is that Amityville home was built there in 1928, and no family that ever lived in that home was ever a happy family. Yeah, the monitor, uh, it'll be coming up shortly. Uh, if Ed, you could explain what this picture is. Uh, oh, yes. I, I told you before how Mr. DeFeo had gone up to uh, Montreal, Canada at the St. Joseph Shrine and brought back a priest with him to uh, exercise the house. Mm -hmm. But he also had special blessed statues made that he surrounded the house with. Now, why did he do that? He was not known for being a pious man in any means. Mm -hmm. He brought him back because something very horrifying was going on in that house. That's why the exorcist and that's why these statues. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Tony, that this is amazing. People were curious regarding why this family had religious statues all over the yard. And they inquired, and DeFeo, Mr. DeFeo Sr., told the neighbors that he had a devil on his back. Coming back to 112 Ocean Avenue, the families that I found had resided in that dwelling place appeared to have a calamity within each one. There was a drowning off the bulkhead in the back. There were problems for each family. The events that allegedly occurred during those 28 days have since become a legendary story. The Lutz didn't expect to leave their home forever that night, but they just couldn't return. It was just too much for them giving up on their dream home. What they left behind was auctioned off later. It was later found out that the paranormal father of the Lutzes from Amityville, Long Island, all the way to San Diego, California. They still suffered from the supernatural nightmare up until they had a special rite of exorcism to rid them of the paranormal nightmare. He performed a rite in his church that helped us for the rest of our lives. There came a point when we said we have to stop blaming things that aren't right or going right in our lives on the house. But as time went on, it was like a half-life. It, it just slowly went away, 
until today really doesn't exist. Could this be one reason why the hauntings seemed to stop after the Lutzes left Amityville? Because the hauntings followed the Lutzes all the way to San Diego? We bought the house for $80,000. It had a mortgage of 60000 We had put another 4000 or so down at the closing. When the auctioneer took care of the contents of the house, uh, I think we netted $1,600, something like that, from the sale. We moved to California, and we started over. We left to the house because the house became uninhabitable. As far as we were concerned, there was no reason to stay there anymore. There were too many things happening too often uh, and confronting us constantly. The, but the, the, those specific events are not something that we try to sit down and explain to anyone else. That's why the book was done, so that that's not something that we have to go through anymore. There were tests, I understand, done on uh, George Lutz? Oh, yes. And George Lutz, Lutz had... Three lie detector tests, and so did his wife, Kathy, and they passed every one. And the man you see in the background there is Mr. Chris Gugas, mm -hmm. who was president of the Polygraph Association of America. He said to me, you know, Ed, after these people passed those tests, he said, it was so frightening what they told me that I started wearing a crucifix again that I had worn during the uh, Second World War when I was in combat. That's wow. how bad it was. And, and then you see Kathy here, she's being tested, mm -hmm. and they had uh, voice stress tests taken also, mm -hmm. which they passed. They passed all these tests in recounting their experiences in these homes. You know, Lorraine and I have been in hundreds and hundreds of haunted houses, and we've interviewed numerous people all mm -hmm. over the world. I watch people, I look at them, I watch their body movements. I know what they should say, I know the, how they should answer me when I ask them a question. Right. These people were right on. Mm -hmm. There was no hesitation. The phenomena that they described to us was the type of thing that happens in this house. So you could say then unequivocally, unequivocally that George and Kathy were not lying, that it was not, not a lying. No, no, they, they were, were not. not lying. Now this story of the Amityville horror is very controversial. And there is a lot of debate on whether or not these stories are true. Many have claimed that the Lutz has made up the tales to make money. However, to stake all of their reputation and lives on a chance that someone will find their story interesting enough to write a successful book just seems really crazy to attempt a risk like that. Up until the day that George and Kathy passed away, they maintained their story, that they really experienced the paranormal events, that their story was true. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave a like on this video and please remember to subscribe for more of the paranormal side. So what do you think of the story? Do you believe the haunting story to be true or just a big hoax? Leave us a comment below.